Hello everyone, my name is Pixorifs, and in this video I will show you how to build my automatic copper aging facility, which I've nicknamed David because it started as a copper field. This has been a passion project since the introduction of copper in 1.17, when I started, as many people do, placing copper blocks several blocks apart to help it age faster. I quickly decided this was something redstone could help me with and set about constructing my first mechanically assisted copper aging facility. This has gone through several iterations across my survival guide series and Empire's SMP, even building a version of the machine on Hermitcraft during my brief visit there. But now I've come up with a new version with more automation for loading and unloading, which makes the whole process smoother and easier. This is David version 6. A single floor of it can age 9 stacks of copper blocks at a time, so 3 floors will age an entire single chest or shulker box of copper, and from there, the sky is the limit. By the end of the video you'll be primed to build your own copper aging facility and I'll provide schematics for a few different layouts depending on your needs. There's a lot to cover here, so I'll post timestamps to different video chapters so you can navigate this video more easily. First of all, a couple of quick notes. This is a Java Edition tutorial. While some parts of this machine might work the same way on Bedrock Edition, it makes use of slime and honey block flying machines which unfortunately don't work the same way on Bedrock. Also, I'm not presenting this as the best way to age copper. It's not a cheap machine to build, especially at full scale, and there are other approaches to copper aging which get around a few of this machine's potential flaws. I recommend checking out Cubic Meter's channel for a copper aging factory which uses a different and many people would argue a better approach than what I'm showing you here. The technical Minecraft community values efficiency so highly that there often isn't room for a variety of approaches, but with this project I had a vision I wanted to see through to its natural conclusion, a copper aging factory that actually feels like a factory. And the whole reason I'm showing you this design is because I'm proud of it, and I think it's still quite good at what it does. You might not have seen many people building a machine to age their copper for them, so why are we doing this? When you place a block of copper in the world, over time it will oxidise. Beginning as a fresh copper block, it will go through two middle stages, exposed and weathered copper, before arriving at its final stage, oxidised copper. But oxidised copper has a hidden advantage. By right-clicking with an X, you can scrape off the oxidation and the block will go back a stage, even reaching the point where it can look like a fresh block of copper again. This makes oxidised copper the ideal block if you want to build with the copper block palette, since with a few scrapes of an X, it can be any block in the copper family. This makes it much easier to work with if you're trying to match its colour to other blocks in your build. You won't need to wait for copper to get through its awkward teenage phase before it'll fit in with prismarine or warped wood. Aging copper blocks is a waiting game, but luckily we have some deeper game mechanics to help us out. When a copper block receives a random tick, the same mechanic the game uses to randomly grow crops or spread grass, it has a chance to age, but first it checks for other copper blocks in a four block range around it. If it finds other copper blocks of a similar age, it can choose not to age at all. It then waits until the next random tick comes around to try again. But if it doesn't detect any copper blocks of the same age nearby, it's more likely to age one step. At that point, if its age matches any other copper blocks nearby, it will detect those, and once again it's less likely to choose to age. So the fastest way to age copper to its final oxidised state is to make sure there are either no copper blocks within range, or make sure any nearby copper blocks have already fully oxidised. This has led to the misconception that copper ages fastest if it's near some oxidised copper. This isn't actually true. Copper will age at the same speed whether it has oxidised copper nearby or no copper blocks at all. Think of it this way, a single block of copper will age at a certain rate. Oxidised copper doesn't speed it up, but regular exposed or weathered copper can slow it down. So my goal from the early days of working with copper was to place it with a four block gap between each block, making sure any other copper was out of range until it had fully oxidised and was no longer going to hold up the ageing process. But walking around placing all these blocks by hand got tedious and boring. So I created a redstone contraption which let you load a slime block flying machine with as much copper as it could push, nine blocks on each side, and fly it down the room with sticky pistons spaced four blocks apart, pulling out the copper blocks as they arrive. Once the copper had fully aged, a player could pull a lever to eject all the oxidised copper and return it on the same flying machine. 
Later, I was able to engineer a mechanism which counted the stages as the copper block aged, automatically ejecting it when it was oxidized, and automatically launching the flying machine to retrieve the blocks once they were all done aging. This is the module that appears in basically every version of the machine, so right now I'll show you how to build that block by block. Before you start, at floor level, you're going to want to mark out two lines of material four blocks apart like this, with four blocks in the middle. We're going to run redstone wire along those for a reason I will explain later. To begin our first circuit, we're going to place a building block on top of this redstone block there, add a repeater on top set to two ticks, and add building blocks on either side of the repeater there and there. We're also going to add a block on top of that. We're going to place a redstone dust there, two redstone torches here and a building block on top of that second redstone torch. So it should look like this so far. On top of that, we're going to put a sticky piston facing that way, another sticky piston attached to the piston head facing this way, and a slime block on top of that. Next, we want to place an observer with its redstone output facing downwards towards this redstone dust. So I'm just going to put a block there temporarily to help us do that. Now, when we place a copper block on top of this observer, the system will capture it. And basically anything else that happens over the top of this observer isn't going to affect the circuit at all. With that copper block removed, we're going to build the counter mechanism, starting with an observer there, a solid block attached to that, two solid blocks coming out the side of this redstone repeater, a dropper facing upwards, and a dropper with contents facing downwards. This dropper is going to have four wooden shovels in it, and that's going to be what counts the stages of the copper block aging. We're going to place a redstone comparator facing into this block here with the redstone torch on top. Next to that, we need to have another redstone comparator, which is going to be measuring some sort of container. I'm going to use a furnace with a wooden shovel in the item slot and five sticks in the fuel slot. Basically, a stack and five items, or 69 total items is what's required. The wooden shovel is there because it's an unburnable, unstackable item, so it takes up the space of 64 items, and the sticks are just the cheapest fuel I could think of. The furnace and this comparator are there to create a side input signal, making sure that this comparator does not switch on until all four of these wooden shovels are in the bottom dropper. The first one will go in there when the machine first captures the block of copper. You'll notice that there are now only three shovels in there, there's one in the bottom dropper. Now if I simulate the stages of the copper block oxidizing by pressing this button on top of here a couple of times, that will eject two more shovels into the lower dropper. When the last shovel goes in there, the system reactivates, this comparator switches on, and the copper block is ejected from the circuit. To signal to the flying machine that this copper block is ready for collection, we're going to place another block on the outside here. We're going to place a redstone dust on top of there and a redstone torch attached to the side. Normally this will stay lit when the circuit is aging a block of copper, but once the copper is finished aging, this torch will deactivate. And along with the 17 other circuits in this module, that's going to be sending a signal down to the flying machine. Once all the redstone torches switch off, the flying machine switches on and returns with all of the copper attached to it. Now on the opposite side, above the second redstone line, we are going to be building an identical circuit just mirrored on the opposite side, and this time we're going to use a honey block up here instead of a slime block. The reason for this is because we're building each of these circuits back to back, so when this circuit contracts, it's going to push a honey block out there, and that's going to meet another circuit on the opposite side that's being pushed around by a slime block. Slime blocks and honey blocks do not attach to each other, but if this was two slime blocks, it would try and pull both of these slime blocks around at once, and that could break one circuit or the other when this piston retracts. The other cool thing about this is that the width of the circuit doesn't allow for the copper blocks to be any closer than four blocks apart, so all of the spacing is maintained throughout the width of the room as well as the length. Now naturally we want to make sure that this module doesn't interfere with the next one in line, so we need to leave one empty block there, but this is where we can start our next module so the next repeater goes here. Eventually as we go down the room we end up with nine of these modules on each side, and I've left this last one with one shovel left in the dropper just so we can demonstrate what happens when all of these blocks end up getting returned. But before we can do that, we need to do a couple more things. First of all, underneath each of the building blocks below this bottom dropper, we need to place an observer facing downwards looking at this redstone line. The redstone line can end directly underneath the last observer in these rows, but it's going to need to carry a redstone signal all the way along it, which means we will have to place repeaters down every so often just to make sure the signal carries. So starting just before each of these two observers here, we'll place a repeater on either side, we'll count along three observers, and we'll place another repeater just before that fourth one there, and just before this fourth one here. That should be 14 blocks of redstone dust, so the signal won't decay before it reaches the next repeater. We'll count three more along here, 
place another one just before that fourth one there, and that should be all we need for the signal to carry all the way down to the observers at the end. That redstone line is going to connect up over here, and it's going to be responsible for sending a redstone signal to each of these observers, which in turn will pulse these droppers, pushing the shovels from the bottom of the timer up into the top, and effectively resetting the counter for the next set of blocks. It's going to do that when the flying machine returns, bringing all this copper with it, which means the next step is to build the flying machine. The flying machine is going to be docked at this end of the room and is going to feature two slime blocks arranged like so with sticky pistons facing in either direction. We're going to launch the slime block using a note block over here. So we want to place one of those there with an observer facing upwards into that. That's going to be the thing that activates the flying machine. And we'll put a placeholder block here so we can place another observer facing upwards with the output down into that slime block. Behind this, we better have some obsidian so that the flying machine knows not to go any further than this. That's just a non-pushable or pullable block. You can use furnaces or droppers. And a few blocks away from the end over here, we're going to place a similar obsidian barrier so that the flying machine doesn't go any further than this. It will drop off the copper wrapped around this block of obsidian here. Before we set it off, underneath one of the lines of copper that's going to come back, and we don't really mind which at this point, we're going to build up a little staircase here that's going to have an observer facing down into the top of it. And what that's going to do is when the copper makes its return, when the copper is pushed over this, it's going to send a signal down those lines to reset all of the items inside the droppers. All we should need to do is fly down here, right click on this note block, that's going to send the flying machine off and all the copper blocks are going to be collected by it as it travels down the room. Once the flying machine returns, you'll notice the observer there pulses a bunch of times making sure that the dropper mechanism resets and I built the obsidian too low so the flying machine is just taking off along this side of the world. So as I mentioned before, each one of these redstone torches is going to switch off to let the flying machine know that that copper block is ready and when all of the redstone torches are switched off, we can switch the flying machine on. To do that, we're going to build a platform in the center of this that's going to carry some redstone signal all the way down to the flying machine and activate this note block when it's ready to return. And I'm going to build this as a four block wide platform of some other building material we haven't used yet. I'm using light blue terracotta, but of course it can be basically any block. Once that platform is built, we need to connect up each of these redstone torches, leaving a repeater as it passes the redstone dust here to make sure that this redstone dust doesn't connect to the one that's driving the circuit. That's also going to ensure that any of these redstone torches staying lit will still power the circuit, meaning that the flying machine won't take off just yet. I'm actually going to reconfigure our flying machine so it's slightly more convenient because the signal coming in on the side where the note block is is slightly better. We're going to take a signal out from this redstone torch, run it up a staircase here, and it's going to double back on itself. So we'll need a glass block there to make sure that the redstone wire can pass through that. We're going to have that lead up towards this block here. And on top of that, we're going to have our note block. Putting that there is going to send the flying machine back down the room, but that gives us an opportunity to test the system out. And looking at it now, we probably want to reconfigure a couple of things down this end. We want to make sure that the flying machine has enough room to add copper to each side of it. So we want nine blocks of copper for each side attached to the slime block here. We also want to move this observer back to where the flying machine is docked. We're actually going to move that a couple of blocks further back like this. And if our copper line is starting there, we really want the observer to only detect that first block of copper right there. That way we can make sure that the counter setup is not still resetting when the flying machine tries to deliver the first block of copper to this first circuit here. So we're going to add nine blocks of copper on each side and it will look like one arm is shorter than the other, but that's because the slime blocks are arranged diagonally and that's what's dragging the copper along with it. All of the counter mechanisms here should now be fully reset. So we're going to send this off down the room. And as you can see, as the flying machine makes its way down the module, it's going to drop off one block of copper with each circuit as it passes. Eventually, the flying machine will come to a halt at the end here where it will await the return signal activating. And as you can see, I'd only been talking for a couple of seconds there and one of these copper blocks has already started to age. My random tick speed in this world has not been modified. We're still on a random tick speed of three. It is simply that quick for some of these copper blocks to start aging. It's best not to count on that being the speed though because some of these blocks will take a while and occasionally you will have a full row of fully oxidized blocks except for one block of copper that hasn't even started aging yet. That's just the nature of random ticks. We're going to run a couple of quick commands to simulate all of these blocks aging in unison. So I'm going to have the exposed copper replace any regular copper blocks in there. We're going to replace those exposed copper blocks with weathered copper. And before I could even type in the command, one of these blocks that's kind of eager to age down there has been ejected by the system because it fully oxidized. Now with this command, we're going to do the rest of them. 
And you'll notice as soon as that happens, the note block down the end triggers, it sends the flying machine back down, and the flying machine collects all of the copper blocks from the circuit as it goes. Once it reaches the end, the flying machine runs those copper blocks over this observer, which resets the counter mechanisms, and the player is free to remove the oxidized copper from these arms and replace it with fresh copper ready to be loaded back into the machine. That is one 18 block module of my copper aging facility. Now let's expand things a bit. Let's talk about random ticks for a second, and the best place to do that is in a super flat world with no grass on the top layer, so we've turned the entire thing to dirt. Now I'm going to open up the creative inventory, place one block of grass, we're inside this central chunk here where I spawned, and the grass would slowly spread. We're going to help that out with the random tick speed command, setting it to 30,000, and very quickly you'll see the grass expands in basically all directions. But once it's done that, if I float directly up into the air without moving, you can see it's generated in a very specific pattern. It's a circle with an extra chunk blip there and there, but the circle is made out of full 16 by 16 chunks. We're going to set the random tick speed to zero again so that we don't affect this radius as we fly around, but you'll see that each of these edges is the hard edge of a chunk. Actually, not exactly, because the grass has managed to spread one block further than the border of the outer chunks of this circle, but it still hasn't spread any further than that. And since random ticks are required for aging copper, we're going to be placing all of our copper blocks within this radius and standing in a central point where everything around us can age. By aligning one row of these copper aging modules to the edge of this circle and using a Lightmatica schematic I prepared earlier to copy and paste it, we can see that it's possible to fit 21 of these manually loaded copper aging modules across one half of the circle. And by pasting the other half onto the other side of the radius, we can end up with 42 modules all aging copper within the random tick radius. All we need to do is load up each of these flying machines with 18 blocks of copper along the magenta glazed terracotta strips that I put in here, and then stand in the center of the room, wait for it all to age, and collect it when the machines return with oxidized copper. Of course, it might theoretically be possible to use the space slightly more efficiently, given that there are some outside edges here and this strip in the middle which don't have any copper aging modules, but at a certain point, this starts to become impractical. The other way we can take this to its logical extreme is to understand that random ticks occur in a full chunk. That is a vertical chunk, not just a 16 by 16 flat area on the ground, not even a 16 by 16 by 16 sub chunk. Random ticks are divided up by sub chunks, but random ticks can occur at extreme heights, even when the player is lower down in the world. So the other logical extreme we can go to is to generate a schematic that it genuinely hurts my computer to look at. This is Goliath, and <laughs> loading it up with the schematic almost crashed Minecraft. <laughs> These modules are now stacked from the bottom of the world all the way to the top, and that's the bottom of the world in negative coordinates at around negative 61 is where this world starts, all the way up to the build height limit. I'd estimate there are around 34 rows of this, making it possible to build 1,428 of these individual copper aging modules. Each aging 18 copper at a time gets you just over 25,000 copper, which is about seven and a half double chests of copper all aging at the same time. But of course, the most impractical thing about this machine isn't necessarily even the size and the amount of components it would take to build something on this scale, it's the fact that you would have to load it manually. Naturally, you're going to build multiple floors, you're not just going to have the central series of platforms in the middle, you're going to want to have places that you could walk around, but it just gets impractical in terms of the time you spend loading this manually. In fact, by the time you were done loading row six or seven of this, row one would probably have returned all of that copper to you, so it seems impractical to build something on this scale, only to have it all eject the copper much sooner. Nevertheless, as a thought experiment, pretty fun idea. Being able to age copper using the full height limit of the world is kind of a cool thing. But that really left me with the question of how I was going to attempt automatic loading and unloading of a machine like this. And it took a little bit of doing, but in the end, I finally managed to crack it. This is one quarter of what I'm calling David 6, because this is the sixth proper iteration of the machine, or at least it will be once I've built it in a survival world. And it won't be possible to do a full block-by-block -block tutorial on this, but I'm going to leave a world download and some Lightmatica schematics in the description of this video so you folks can get hold of this world 
and take a look at everything yourself. But what I want to do is explain the basic principles of what's going on here. First of all, this crimson wood area here is your copper loading platform, and you're going to load that on with a series of pistons, which are going to push everything into place, so you end up with a 9x8 square of copper, 72 blocks in total. There are eight modules on this side of the room, which doesn't take advantage of the full random tick radius here, but does allow you to space things out in a way that these flying machines can push eight rows of copper down the room. But each module is going to take two rows, and this flying machine will automatically launch any of the flying machine stations that it goes past, unless we lock those first. So the first thing you do is flick this lever, and that uses locking repeaters to disable each of these repeaters in the first four modules. Then when we hit this button, the flying machine launches, dragging all of the copper down the room with it. You'll notice that it skips over the first four modules. The first eight rows of copper do not get distributed. But then as the copper flying machine passes, this redstone block activates each of these rows of sticky pistons, which pulls the copper down into place. It also sends a signal to the flying machine to take it off down the room and lock it into all of these copper aging modules. Once it reaches the end of the room, the redstone block locks this hopper and activates a timer circuit which allows this dropper to fill the hopper with contents. Once the hopper has 46 items in it, it generates a strong enough redstone signal to activate the redstone lamps, sending the flying machine back down the room, and that avoids it colliding with the flying machine that's distributing copper to this last aging module. Once the flying machine has safely docked here at the loading station, we flip this lever once again, which re-enables the first four modules, and those flying machines are able to take off the next time we load up a full load of copper. With the next 72 blocks of copper loaded up, we're going to hit that button again, and this will now distribute the copper to the first four modules in the row. The flying machine continues down the room, harmlessly activating each of these rows of sticky pistons, and once the timer mechanism runs a second time, it will return to the loading station. At this point, we're going to return to our central chunk. I'm going to re-enable the random tick speed at the default value of three, and we're going to wait for a bunch of this copper to age naturally. Okay, a short while later, we have a bunch of copper that is almost done aging. Right now, we're just waiting on a couple of these blocks to age, although some of them have not yet even started aging. That's just the nature of random ticks. That block just hasn't received any random ticks that have encouraged it to age. But the majority of these are looking like they're aged, and once every single copper block in a row is done, the flying machine will return it as we saw in the previous example. And this row here only has one block left in the weathered copper state that's waiting to be oxidized. So I'm going to eject that one manually by increasing the counter by one, pressing that button on the top there. And that's going to return the flying machine just so we can observe what happens next. As the flying machine returns, it'll reset the counter mechanism and it actually skips past the area where the blocks were loaded, instead returning over here where the flying machine will dock by this redstone lamp, but each of these sets of pistons is effectively going to unload the copper blocks so that they end up in two neat rows waiting for a second flying machine to come back and collect them. At the same time as the first block activated this piston, it also activated a second piston down here, which pushes an observer over here and sends a signal all the way down to a counting mechanism at the end, which has, once again, four wooden shovels in a dropper right here, and that's counting how many of our copper lines return, because remember, these configurations of flying machines can only push eight blocks at a time. So the machine is waiting for four of these modules to return so that there are eight rows of copper, and then this second flying machine is going to launch, returning all of the copper to this warped wood platform over here. It's going to take a little longer for that to happen because some of this copper still has yet to age, so I'll cut to that in a second. But in the meantime, I'll explain why we can't just increase the random tick speed and why I didn't want to just swap all of the copper in here for fully aged copper in order to simulate that. First of all, random tick speed increasing means that the observers counting the stages of copper aging become less reliable. It's already possible for copper with a random tick speed of three, the default for any Minecraft world, to age twice in the space of about four game ticks, which is unfortunately slightly too fast for the observer to detect. Most of the time it's not going to do that, it's incredibly rare in any circumstances that that happens, but that's also why I occasionally put a button on top of the droppers here so that you can go through and manually increase the counter by one in the rare occasion where you end up with a fully aged copper block that's still stuck in the system because the observer hasn't counted it aging twice in very quick succession. So hopefully that explains why we're just waiting for this copper to age naturally in this tutorial. Now I'm going to wait until three more modules have finished aging their copper and this flying machine should be ready to return it all. So our third module just returned its copper and we're just waiting on one more to return. 
it looks like this one right here only has one block of copper left to age. So we're going to eject that one manually just so we can get an idea of what happens when all of them end up returning. But obviously this is going to happen sort of randomly. When the fourth one comes in, it's going to activate this flying machine which will return all of the copper. Once the oxidized copper arrives at this platform, a couple of things are going to happen. First of all, this wall is going to trigger the fly machine to turn around. It's also going to trigger this set of pistons to extract the last row of copper from the flying machine so it doesn't stay stuck underneath the slime and honey blocks there. And it's going to send a signal down the line to reset any of the observers which have been pushed over to send a signal to the counter mechanism. So once this flying machine returns, that dropper is ready to count the other four modules of copper as they return, and those will be automatically returned to this platform as well. It is relatively unlikely, given the speed at which this happens, that one of these modules is going to return its copper while Whilst that flying machine is in motion, either delivering the copper over there or coming back. But if you're worried about that, there is one way we can resolve that. By placing a wall underneath where the flying machine takes off from, we can measure any changes to this wall using an observer. The observer can push out a redstone block sideways using a sticky piston like that, and you'll need to make sure that the piston faces sideways so that the sticky piston doesn't stay activated when it's in contact with the redstone block. Then with a little bit of careful wiring, we can transmit a signal from that redstone block to each of the chains of repeaters down here that are tracking whether or not these copper aging modules have finished. And what that does is effectively lock the flying machine in place, making sure that signal stays there until this flying machine returns. For example here, if I break the sticky piston to simulate the flying machine leaving, it's gonna push that redstone block out. That sends a signal all the way down the line to this module, making sure that the flying machine stays docked at the end. And all you'd need to do is pass the signal between each of these platforms, and that'd make sure the flying machines couldn't take off until this flying machine returned. Now let's take a look at the platform where all of the oxidized copper has come in for collection. Right now, I'm favoring the idea that the player stands around, waits for the platforms to be returned like this, and then manually gets rid of all of the copper. There's even a light here powered by this redstone torch so that whenever a full batch of copper comes in, the light switches on to let you know that this platform is ready for collection. If you're more technically minded and don't mind the additional expense for the contraption, you could figure out some sort of piston feed tape that feeds all of the copper here into a blast chamber with a TNT duplicator. Alternatively, you could set up a whole pad of sticky pistons or honey and slime blocks to make sure that the copper gets pulled out of the way so the flying machine can bring the next eight copper in without getting locked up trying to deliver it to this platform. And as far as this design goes, I'm leaving that up to you, mostly because I didn't have time to perfect an idea like that before I went away on vacation, but mostly because I think the additional expense is a little bit much, considering how many pistons and whatnot we've already put into this contraption. Another potential optional extra we can have here is a row of nine dispensers with a wall, an observer, and some target blocks feeding redstone signal from the observer into the dispensers. Then fill each of these dispensers with a stack of honeycomb. That way, whenever a line of copper returns over these dispensers, it immediately gets waxed, although the dispensers might release a honeycomb after the blocks disconnect from that wall, so you might want to find another way of doing that. Either way, after having manually returned the last of this copper, the flying machine over there should activate, bringing the rest of it back to this platform ready for collection, and we can talk about the full-size version that I showed you at the beginning of this video. In order to create a copper aging machine that can age a full chest or a full shulker box, of copper all at once, we simply have to take that one quarter of the design, flip it, mirror it that way, and then mirror both of those on the opposite side of the room, so that we end up with four quadrants all aging copper at once. That should be 576 blocks of copper, which is nine stacks of copper, and then we duplicate that upwards twice so that we end up with three layers of all four of these quarter modules, as I've been thinking of them. So we now end up with a machine that can age a full shulker box at once. There are a couple of quirks to this that I'd like to point out to you. First of all, we're using these kind of zero-ticked pistons to load this platform nice and quickly, which works maybe about 80% of the time. But the other 20%, you're probably going to run into an issue where the update order, thanks to this redstone dust effectively powering this block and this block, means that this piston activates before that one can. And so your zero-ticked 
piston there is never going to push the copper blocks at all. So what I've done is redesign the piston pushing system here that pushes all eight blocks across the platform. And where this observer would be detecting the wall changing shape once a copper block arrives, it outputs into a two tick repeater, a line of redstone dust along blocks here, and sticky pistons pushing stairs. The reason for stairs is that they don't connect to this wall here and just cause this system to become a clock over and over again. And this repeater is set to two ticks because when the copper gets pushed off the platform, it actually passes this wall over and over again as the blocks are pushed down the room. And if you leave the repeater on one tick, it's slightly faster, but the stairs will detect attach from the sticky pistons when the copper makes its way out. It's only slightly slower than loading up the other platforms, you've just got to put eight blocks in, wait for the stairs to push out and retract, and from there the whole system works exactly the same way. The other major thing you should know is the recurrence of a problem that I mentioned earlier. Very occasionally the game can decide to age copper twice within a very short span of time, shorter than these observers can detect, and occasionally you'll find one of these fully oxidized copper blocks is still stuck in one of the redstone modules. It's very rare that that happens, but on occasion it does happen. So a certain amount of manual observation is going to be necessary at that point, and I would recommend if a module just hasn't returned its copper and it seems like all of the blocks in that row have been aged, you should probably just bring a button down here, pop it down on this wooden block just above the dropper and make sure that counter increases by one. Earlier designs of the machine had buttons on every one of those so you could simply run up and press a button but I think just bringing one button with you and using that as a master key seems like the best solution to that issue. Last of all I've included these four lodestone blocks. These don't have to be functionally speaking lodestone blocks at all, I just thought they looked kind of cool and that's to indicate where the central chunk of the machine is. For best results, this machine should be chunk aligned, so that this is the central chunk that you spend your time AFK in whilst you're waiting for the copper to age. And while this machine doesn't reach the very edge of the random tick radius, it gets pretty close, so it should be aligned to the chunk grid just to prevent any issues like copper at the far back corners not aging when it should be. For best results, you probably want to turn your simulation distance up to at least 12 as well, just so if you walk down one end of the machine to check something, the redstone flying machines at the other end of the machine aren't just going to turn off mid-air. But that is really it. This is David6, and I hope you enjoy poking around this contraption in the world download and schematics that I've provided in the description below. My name has been Pixorus. Thank you so much for watching this tutorial. Let me know if you enjoy this contraption in the comments and hopefully we'll see a few more iterations of it where I've solved some of the other problems with loading and unloading. Don't forget to leave a like on this video if you enjoyed it, subscribe if you want to see more, and I'll see you folks soon. Take care, bye for now.